I am Skinner Myers, and you are listening to the World Is Wrong podcast. We're here to tell you how the world is wrong. The world is wrong about residue. Yeah. Welcome to The World Is Wrong, an extremely positive podcast where we celebrate films and film artists the world is wrong about. My name is Andras Jones, and I am one of your hosts. And my name is Brian Connolly, and I'm one of the hosts. And we are here today to talk about, I think, the most recent film that we've covered on this podcast outside of an Oscars episode. Uh, it was yeah. Actually, one of the nominees for last year's Oscars ceremony, a film called Residue from the director Marawi Garima. Uh, it was a film recommended by last week's guest, Skinner Myers, and I had seen it before because of Skinner's recommendation, but this was your first viewing. Is that correct? Correct. And we're going to play a clip and then start talking about it, but do you have any first impression you'd like to share? No, just I was excited to do this because a year ago when we did the Oscars, uh, Skinner mentioned it, and then you watched it and you told me how great it was, and then I th- I believe you said we're gonna definitely do an episode on that sometime, <laughs> and here we are, nearly a year later, it happened. Yeah, and I'll say I do feel a little bit. We'll get into it, but with a lot of the films that we cover, they have had their life. They're sort of, we're, we're resurrecting them or we're coming at them. Like, I don't feel so much of a responsibility to them, but with this one, I do feel like the world hasn't had a chance to be right or wrong about this one yet. And I'd like to encourage the world to be right about it before it has to be wrong about it. And that needs to be corrected. And so uh, let's play a clip and then let's just dig right into it. There might be spoilers. There might be spoilers. There might be spoilers. Yeah. Look. What's up, y'all? Yeah? How y'all doing? What's up? Good. Yeah. Alright. Y'all remember me? Jay. I'm across the street. Bond, son? Over in 48. Miss Miss B. Miss B, son. You Miss B, son. What's up, man? Wow, man. Oh, that thing is up, like. You can do it, do it, thing. Little crumb snatch back in the day. Yeah. He got hair on his face, sir. He got a little darker, though. Nah, hey, man. Just got back from Cali today. Oh, Yeah. You know, I'm trying to figure it out. Looks a lot different around here. Yeah, it is, man. Yeah. A lot of white folks move back up here, man. Big time. Anyway, um, I'm looking for Demetrius. Y'all remember Demetrius, right? That's a kid you used to be with riding the bicycle. Talk about Demetrius living on the street? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Y'all seen him around? Not lately, man. Not lately. No way. Thank God. He be coming and going, you know. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, no way. Yeah. He used to live up. What, he moved or something? Last time I heard he was living out in Maryland or something. Maryland? What are you doing out there? Probably doing the same thing he was doing here. Probably shaking and baking. Getting that money. Man, he used to live up the street, man. He ain't around here no more. He used to live yeah. up the street, man. We ain't seen him, man. We don't know where he at, man. He used to live up the street, hey, man. About 15 years, man. We don't know where he at, man. He used to live up the street, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah.
about two niggas go right there. You know, what you know. Said, Wish she still lived across the street. Yeah, I know that's right. Yeah. Where she yeah. go anyway? I don't nobody know. Yeah, I don't know. know. Yeah, but they I'm still own the house. Her grand, her son still coming back and forth to this. So. Right, right, right. Residue is a film by Marawi Garima from 2020 about a man named Jay, played by Obina Nwachukwu, who returns from going to college in Los Angeles to the Washington, D.C. neighborhood known as Q Street with the intention of making a film about this neighborhood where he grew up, only to find that his neighborhood isn't really there anymore. As Jay navigates the gentrification slash colonization of his old hood by real estate predators and the good-intentioned young white people who have moved in and taken over, he seeks out the kids he used to run with, particularly his friend Demetrius. Demetrius is nowhere to be found, and Jay's search for him makes some of his old friends suspicious and reveals that most of his old friends are either dead or in prison, in one case on drug possession charges, while the new residents of Q Street prosper in the homes which were sold to cover the costs of losing family members to prison and death. These new residents smoke weed and drink openly, walking freely on streets in groups, where Jay and his friends were criminalized for doing the same things. And as these pressures mount, we see their effect on Jay, leading to one of the most subtly devastating endings to a film that I have ever seen. I don't know if it had that effect on you, Brian, but it just, it really sticks with me. So, uh, yeah, that's Residue. Whew, yeah, it's a heavy, it's a heavy movie. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful. Um, <clears throat> and beautiful, <laughs> yeah. It, and like, and right away, immediately when you watch it, you can tell it's a unique voice. Like just by the way it's shot, like this does not look like a normal, even independent movie that you're used to seeing. Yeah, yeah. Do I know how the world is wrong about this? I would love to know how the world is wrong about this movie. Well, as I sort of teased at the at the intro, uh, this being one of the newest films we've covered, the world hasn't really had a chance to be wrong yet. But at the same time, the film has been out for a year. And considering how unique and powerful and beautiful it is, I'm a little bit surprised that I haven't heard anything. Have you heard anything outside of me and Skinner talking about it, about this film? No, not at all. <laughs> and you work for the Austin Film Society. So you work in a, in a you know, you're not just like someone on the, on you know, out in the world seeing stuff online this just this film is hasn't really been in the conversation which is very surprising to me yeah and i wonder if that's i mean there's a few reasons i think that might be why uh one may be because it came out in 2020 when movie theaters weren't as open and festivals weren't in person (laughs) and like maybe this would have played at the austin film society if they were open but they weren't open that year you know, COVID shut it down. Uh, so that may be kind of why it's a slower roll as opposed to things that like actually play at festivals where people go and it's a word of mouth and it starts playing at this art house and that and it's finding its audience. It's so much harder, I think, to find an audience just through streaming, which is kind of where this movie ended up. And then I think the second problem is that it's on Netflix and Netflix does not do a good job of advertising any movies that they don't make themselves the day that it comes out. <laughs> like, you just, like, I was shocked when this was on Netflix. I was like, oh, that's great. Cause, like, I'm on Netflix all the time. I never saw this movie pop up in anything telling me that it was on there. Uh, you have to know to look for it. But if you don't know what the movie is, how are you going to know to look for it? This is the problem with streaming. Uh, <laughs> so it's, it just kind of is buried. I think it got buried, and every week more new indie movies get added to Netflix and big movies that, like, this movie's kind of sadly kind of in the background. And I think this is the kind of movie that maybe people are hungry for and don't even know it. Yeah. Oh, uh, absolutely. It walks so many fine lines so uh, powerfully for me. Um how do we want to? How do we want to dig into this? I guess let's first just let, let's just talk about some of the kinds of films this is. So 
One, it's about a filmmaker making a film about going back to his neighborhood, about a guy going back to his neighborhood to make a film <laughs> about that neighborhood. And yeah. uh, from what I know from Skinner, this is that's that's how this film started. This is a true story for to some degree. At at a certain point, it shifts into being you know uh, being fiction. Uh, things didn't Marawi Garima didn't his his story didn't go the way Jay's story goes in the end but so there's that something about the returning home story yeah and and the film the artist returning home and I'm so glad it didn't like go into the trite tropes that always happens with that where it's like he's filming everything on a video camera and we're seeing it from the point of view like if this movie came out in 1991 and was made by some film school guy that would have had so much of that. Like when he talked to his friends, he would be filming it and you'd see it and you'd be like, oh God. Mm-hmm. <laughs> or a lot of scenes of him like on his typewriters, just like thinking about and struggling and trying to figure, you know, like I just feel like I'm glad that he is a filmmaker, but the movie isn't about him making the movie yet. He's just there kind of to get inspiration, I get, you know, or just to like, you know, he was already a filmmaker and to write a script. But he's just sort of like getting a feel for like the neighborhood and like the old the his his childhood and things like that, and so I'm glad it didn't fall into like the lame like film student showing up sort of <laughs> things that it could have fallen the trap it could have fallen into. And then it's it's very much a film about gentrification and the effects of gentrification. And I don't yeah. know if I've ever seen a film that I mean I you know there are like the what's What's the one? What's the Hal Ashby film? The Landlord. Like there are yeah. films that have touched on it, but I had never, not, never like this. And I haven't seen all the movies that have ever been made, but there's something that just feels <laughs> like very unique about this take on gentrification. And one of the things that I think it does really powerfully is, uh, it's it tells a black story but it is very aware of the of the white audience and what it says to that white audience as speaking of as a member of that audience is really i don't feel like the film is made for me and i feel like the film is also made for me it's making a very specific point that it wants to make to me and people like me who move, might move into a neighborhood like that. And, yeah. But without us being in the center of it, with us <laughs> being on the outskirts and seeing how we are seen as the outsiders by people that we might see as outsiders because we have no context. And, and such yeah. a huge... And without ever hammering that point home but subtly making it throughout and balancing <laughs> making a film for two different audiences, one that you want to throw your arms around and one that you want to teach a lesson to. Yeah. And it does both so well is yeah. mind-blowing. And, it's, and what's great about it is that like I feel like mo- the, any other movie like this, it would have made the white people more out, like outwardly, like more, like more, yeah, mean. they would have made them into racists. These are guys, people are just trying to be polite, nice white people, and they don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And they don't know that it's equally offensive. Like, the like they're, it, there's, like, the the way the guy's, like, just inviting her to the you know, the barbecue. <laughs> and and there's just, like, all these moments are, like, the, the, the worst thing that happens, like, in terms of vocally is the guy at the beginning tells him that his music is too loud he needs to turn his music down or he's going to call the cops. No, it is. Like, no, I know. He says, but a guy wrote this down because the line is really perfect. It says, just turn the music down and you're double parked. Don't make me call the cops. <laughs> yeah, have, a nice <laughs> have a nice day. Have a nice day. Yeah. Don't make me, don't you make me <laughs> call the cops. <laughs> and then I think the most violent is like the people with the dog who craps on the lawn. You hear them kind of yell, and I think they they throw something at the car, maybe or so. Like you hear, yeah, they say something. Some, they they yell at his mom because she chases them off his lawn, and they're like, and they're this, the same thing. Like, have a nice day. <laughs> have a nice day is a very and, insulting thing to say well, in this movie. 
And I think that it covers sort of what you don't see in movies is that the people that tend to move into these neighborhoods aren't the racist outwardly. <laughs> like, they're not like the, the horrible racist people in the way that you think it is. These are like the hipsters. You know, these are the young the young people that are liberal, that are the artists or whatever. That think they're, and, yeah, that think and they're, they're hip and, and groovy. And, yeah. and like, and it's, and like this movie hits on those little things so well. Like just the the guy like the the guys at the end who walk to the other side of the street. Yeah. Like they don't say anything, they just kinda of see them and they just walk the other side of the street. And those people probably are like, I voted for Obama, I have black friends, I care about this and that, but they're like it's still there's something in their brain, it's like, yeah, I need to go to the other side of the street. You know? There's this there's still just a there's that racism still or the prejudice is still within even people who are the most decent or think they are the most decent of people. Well, I would say it even goes further. And I think this is where the, the film, like they're all like, it's not because of how things are set up because of the history and the context that these people are unaware of. It is a natural thing to walk across. Like they're not doing it to be racist. They're just, walking across the street from a guy who's alone and scowling at them and looking very angrily at them, which yeah. is a very natural thing to do. And at the same time, it's sort of like they're one. I think one of the things that I love about the film and what you're getting at is that it represents that these are people living in an unnatural situation. And the unnatural situation would be, uh, Skinner says it very eloquently in the last episode, is white supremacy. And that is like, that's a word that is a hot button for a lot of people. But what this film is saying, like the, the double standards that the film represents of like, while we're seeing Jay remembering what it was like to be a kid in this neighborhood where his friends were getting shot and getting busted and get and being thrown in jail and losing their lives for have for possessing some marijuana. And then he goes to this 4th of July party and like, think the hipsters can just order marijuana to be delivered and they can just smoke it <laughs> and there's no cops yeah. busting in the door there's no helicopters overhead yeah you know, and it's not it's not the white folks fault that they are not being who are not being punished as being a as I was I'm I am that guy you know I am that white pot smoker who smoked pot through the 90s and I felt terrible that there were other people who were getting busted. I just, it, I never did. And I was able to not. And, but it's, in, I guess that's again what this film does so wonderfully. It, it indicted me without indicting me by just showing me behavior and showing me the impact of that behavior on people who, because I didn't have their experience, I wouldn't even know that yeah. offering a, a joint to the, one of the few black guys at this party to try and make him feel more comfortable to be there and to invite him would be a huge insult. And you wouldn't know it, that ju- that guy just kind of came from visiting one of his best friends who is in prison for decades for that, for just doing that. They're the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. It's great. And, and it's like nothing in this movie is beyond believability. Like it's all like this all feels so real. Like everything. this whole everything, like every note of this movie strikes a, a chord of reality. Uh, and I, I, yeah, and I also like it's in a way it sort of feels like that genre that we've you know talked about before in a few movies where like you have the like usually in the movie it's the guy comes to the town and he's the stranger, and everyone in the town is like, Stranger, what are you doing here? Get out of our town. And this is the reverse where the guy is coming to the town that is, was his home and everybody there is now the stranger. It's a town full of strangers that should have been his family and friends. It's, but instead, it's these new people in the in the apartments, in the street. And the, the movie does a good job of kind of going from the past in the and the present and kind of juxtaposing what like here's this celebration like it was like looks like Fourth of July is that what it is? Fourth of July, mm-hmm. and what it was like, and then know what it's like now, and um, or like what it, yeah, what it was like just driving through the neighborhood, and what it is like now, and it just it just does such a good job, but without it being like 
the way they do flashbacks in this movie is great. And like there's certain scenes where it just do, it doesn't feel like like a normal lame flashback. It's it's done so organically that it just like floats in and out from like because the past and the present are kind of together in this at the same time for this guy. Uh, and it's hard not to like for him to constantly be thinking about like how it used to be like for good and worse and what it is like now. And I think the movie just does a good job of kind of showing these these existences. And I think that's how it really is. As someone like when I, I my experience was very different. But I grew up in Olympia. I left probably about the same age that that, that Jay leaves Q Street and came back after about at about the same age. And I've chosen to live there. And my life, one of the things that I like about my life there is that it feels the way that this movie, like like the way this movie deals with memory, how it just sort of floats into the present and past it while you're waking up or going to sleep or getting mm-hmm. distracted before something then happens in your real life that then triggers those memories again. And that could be triggered just by a rocking chair on the corner or mm-hmm. yeah. uh, the way the light comes through the tree. It, through the trees or by a traumatic event like the death of a, of a friend or, or something. So yeah, yeah, it really did capture. It's so funny because after coming out of the film, the conversation with Skinner last week, I'm thinking about black cinema and this clearly is that it's, it, he cited this as an example of it. And at the same time, what's great about it is so, is what's so universal about it. And the fact of being able to make a film that is making such a a strong point and to be on the, you know, if I, there's a target of that point, to be in that, placed in that role with the film, and yet the, to have most of my, having all of my experience be one of these, this uni- universal feeling of trying to return to a home that isn't there anymore. And that places it in a world of a kind of literature and a kind of storytelling that, again, is universal. And I think that it's able to, again, to, again totally function in all these very different ways, all of them effectively. Mm-hmm. It's just what I love most about film in general is that it, it really can do that. Uh, you know, we didn't talk about the other, the other kind of film. It is it's a detective film. He's yeah. he, he's looking for his f- friend Demetrius, and it is kind of a detective film in that film noir kind of way that he doesn't even know he's a detective until he starts yeah, yeah. just innocently looking for his friend. But the more people get suspicious and weird about him for asking, the more it turns him into the dogged detective who is going to like <laughs> – now he's asking much more forcefully than he would have ever asked. And he's yeah. putting people on the spot and he's trying to, you know, and uh, I, what do you think about the detective aspect of this? No, that was totally, yeah, that, that totally works in that way. You're, you're right. It's just like, you just, it's because it starts kind of as just a normal, like, hey, where, where's, yeah, where's my friend? And then just like the instant strange reaction to that question is like, okay. And then you ask it again. And then it's like, it gets weird. More people getting more defensive about it and weird until you you find it out you know and it, i like that element of it of just because you're now in this you're in this town that's not the same town it was anymore it's full of all these strange new people and even the people you know either are just missing or they're just they're not being helpful <laughs> or they've they've changed like something's changed with them where they are not the, the the relationship that you had with them is not the same that it was you know 10 years before or that you've changed because that's what they're they, telling yeah. him. You know, like yeah. there's there's this great scene where he uh, or Jay is talking. He find like he find there's one of his friends who has been weird about it and has challenged him, and you get a sense they are they're they get a moment to be alone and they're talking real with each other and he's just like, like hey can you just tell me about this i'm you know my, our other friend just got killed and it's you know it's an emotional scene and he's talking to his friend and his friend's like yeah well i don't know but you know 
you know, you're the movie guy. And, you know, I actually have an idea for a movie. He's like, what? He's like, oh, it's nothing. And he's like, well, just tell me. He's like, okay, well, it's about these two brothers. And they grew up in a war zone. And then one brother leaves. And the other one had to stay behind and take care of everyone. And pretty much gave his life to take care of all of these people. And the other brother, he's just off and just doing his shit. And he doesn't know anything about it. And then, what is this line? There's this, it's just so, like, and you see this, it's just, it's really great writing. And he says, oh, the end of his thing is like, yeah, but everyone can see through his transparent ass. And this guy who, Jay, being the one who went away to college and thinks he's there and he's sort of smarter then, he's just been He's sort of like what uh, – he, he sort of does what Nicolas Cage does to that uh, to that chef and pig. Like he just kind of takes Jay apart using Jay's own art. He's like, you want a film? Okay, I'll give you a film. This film's about you and you weren't here. And everyone can see what you are, that you aren't one of us anymore. And – I don't know. It, it it is. It's a to me. That's one of those great noir moments where the detective realizes that he's not the hero of his story, <laughs> even though he's still the hero of our story. That moment, because that guy kind of seemed like a dick through the up to this point in the movie, and that's a moment where all of a sudden you see, oh no, he's just, he's living in an even deeper context than Jay's context. Jay's coming to this con, con coming to this as kind of a, a little boy, which is why we keep seeing these flashbacks of this little boy. He's trying to work on his little boy. And these kids who stayed there didn't, you know, that little boy is gone. They've had to live a, def, a stronger, diff, more difficult life that he is trying to make a movie about, you know? Yeah. And again, great filmmaking to have the filmmaker take, him own, take his own self down so beautifully in a film that then elevates his film again. Fantastic. I have some other scenes and things I'd like to dig into, but I, I'm also talking a lot here. Do you, do you have any <laughs> other? What, what are what are some of the other things that, that insights that you that you have to share about this film? Well, I was just really happy when watching this movie that it was sort of like a very loose narrative, very artistic film. Like usually when you hear that you're going to watch a independent movie and it's going to deal with some heavy issues you kind of think it's going to be a certain type of movie. And this movie had a very, you know, just like, just like that. I like that kind of homemade, no budget feel to it. You know, we can tell that this is a small crew, <clears throat> that this is like not a fancy, you know, group making a movie. This is like people, like it just feels like people on the street running around making a movie. And I just loved just the way it looked like the, all the weird off kilter angles, how you'd have a lot of conversations with, these strangers that Jay would have, but you never see the person he's talking to, or you just see sort of like a part of them, but the camera never kind of shows us their faces. Like the people who let their dog poop on the yard. You don't ever really see them, you know, but they're very present in that scene. And yeah. There's a lot of scenes like that. And there's a lot of scenes like that where like, there are like the part where he first sees his friend after he hears a gunshot and he wakes up in the middle of the night comes out. There's At the end of that scene, I'm assuming it's a cop shows up because you see the lights, but you never see the car and you only hear the voice of the police officer. You don't ever see them. And you know? yeah, you just see a blue light and you hear these two guys yeah. get up. And not to get into like vocal stereotypes, but the two cops talk just like the two guys that are on this, they sound like they're coming from the same neighborhood. They have the same dialect. So there's but not like, anything yeah. vocally. They're not like, ah, yeah. you know, it's not yeah. like, but Gorman McGorry, what's going on here? You two? <laughs> not two Irish cops. Yes. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I like, but that, but, and I don't know if like part of that is a budget thing or what, but I think it was just an, but I think it was it's very, probably both, both. Like, yeah. it's like, you don't, don't want to get a cop car, just get a light. But it also just adds that that kind of like, at least for the viewer, for me, it's like kind of a little bit of a paranoia or like an uncomfortable feeling of like, I don't really know who this, I don't see the face of the person he's talking to. Like, I don't really get an idea of who these people are. These people that keep yelling at him or talking to him, but you never see, you never really see them or you see them from far away. And I really, I really liked that. I really thought that was a very, um, 
just unique way to to kind of just to frame things. And then the other thing that really stood out for me in this movie was the sound design. I thought it was the fantastic. Um, did you pick up on just how good the sound design is in this movie? I mean, I guess you have to if you're not showing things and you're hearing stuff. But like, mm-hmm. just that again, that first scene where he sees his friend and they're kind of talking on both sides of a, of a metal fence, right? Mm-hmm. And you just hear, like, it's the middle of night and you're hearing... Just the sounds of night. You're hearing a siren in the distance. You're hearing like crickets or frogs, or whatever. You're hearing cars, like sounds from the city. And there's just like a whole. I think those are cicadas. Might... Cicadas. Okay. Because I, yeah. <laughs> I noticed it enough that I looked it up. I was like, I think those are cicadas. Yeah. What, what's the difference? Do they sound that different? I couldn't. Tell. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, crickets are more like cicadas. Is actually more something you would hear in the city. Got it. You wouldn't really hear crickets. <laughs> But I really thought that that was like this. All the scenes had this great soundscape to it. This great, like whoever did the sound uh, in this movie, kudos, <laughs> you did a great job. <laughs> like that's not usually a thing I notice, you know, because I think most movies the sound mix is just kind of all leveled out, and it's like when you hear a really good album that's recorded, just like very, there's something really exciting about it, and you're like, oh, they did something different. It's not just all the same. And so I really appreciated that. I think that was a, a one of the highlights for me was just the, how he did the sound for everything. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and the the lead actor, Obina Nwachuku, uh, Skinner had singled him out as a uh, his choice for best actor for yeah. the Oscars last year, and I enjoyed it. Well, the, the first time I watched it, I didn't enjoy his performance because I was just, I would look as the film was the first time you watch this film. It's like I didn't enjoy his performance, but I wasn't able to just enjoy his performance because I was experiencing it with him. And what he's experiencing is difficult stuff. And also the first time you meet an actor on film, it's the first time you meet them and you're just, you know, just having that impression, but watching it again today and getting to really watch his performance, it's a very special uh, just moment to moment, very reactive. There's so much that happens that we just, we feel what's going on with them without words. Like the, the, the difference, the different tones that he's ma- that he manages to hit throughout from, and his descent almost into, um, I don't know, being haunted by the ghosts of this neighborhood. I guess maybe that's the other kind of movie it is. It is, to some extent, kind of a ghost story because he comes yeah. back and he's so haunted by... Well, he's haunted by... Whether this is a fair account or not, in reality, it's certainly the experience of this guy, a, a genocide. He, he comes back to a place and it's not just that everyone left... They've been killed and they've been imprisoned and they've been impoverished and their ghosts haunt him into an action which, uh, well, is, can, I, I guess we need to just like, let's get to, spo- we need to spoil this film because to really talk about it, we need to spoil it. Yeah. So this is where we're, you know, if you don't want to have it spoiled for you, it's easy to find, go watch the film. But, okay, at the end of the film, we talked about it, he walks by these two seemingly just sort of nice white guys who cross the street because he's looking really uh, angry and he's black and all of the things that that means. And he gets so pissed off, he chases one down and beats him up brutally, brutally, brutally if it happened to me. Uh, not brutally for film, um, yeah. which leads to this f- this end, which is him running, and then the last shot, effectively, is we see it from the point of view of these two people who are appalled. Why are they? The, why are the cops chasing that guy? And then that's all they care about it. And then the movie is pretty much there. It ends on. It doesn't 100% end because there's a flashback to his kids. But the story, Jay's story, effectively ends with him as a weird thing that happens 
down the street from this nice place where the people who would who are going to be the heroes of whatever movie happens next there. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and and aren't and don't they start talking about the, the what the neighborhood is called? Is that yeah. the same? And yeah. there'd be like and it has a little like Soho sta- sounding. What Soho, are they called? WeHo, Momo. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> It's like now this is like the cute way that people are going to refer to this neighborhood. And I mean, the cops like aren't just chasing him. They're chasing him out probably forever. Like he, that guy is not going to be in that neighborhood anymore. It's now for these people on this balcony of what I can imagine is some new mixed use condo that was built over something old, (laughs) you know, that's like three years old that all these parts of town kind of have now. Uh, and they can be appalled by it, but they're like in the safety of their tower, you know. Yeah, chasing um, him out or chasing him down and imprisoning yeah. him or killing him. I mean, yeah. that's effectively what the film is saying. And that's and maybe these people will go to the protest for the death of about the death of this guy. Uh, unless they know the guy who was beaten up and then they'll have complicated feelings. But all of it, it'll be they'll be back in the. They're going to be back in the center of this story, basically at the end, where and it's, it makes that to I don't know about for you, but for me that turnaround was. Well, did, well what what was your experience of that of that last shot? Yeah, I, it's really powerful. It's great because it's just like there's so many tones also going on there. Yeah, like it's really it's really just like you don't expect it. You're like oh whoa. And because no other part of the movie had did, really done that. Like, it showed sort of more his point of view of dealing with these people. Yeah, that's the first time the film gives you a seeing... white point of view. That real Fucking A, yeah. And at the very end. and it, But it's used just like, as such a strong punctuation because of that. And it's just like, it's such a strong way to end the movie. The strongest way to end the movie. And it's really upsetting and unsettling. Kind of funny, you know? Because it's also kind of absurd, but also very real. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's kind of like the whole roller coaster of emotions just in, I think it's just one shot too, right? I think it just kind of pulls back and yeah. I don't think there's any cuts. Yeah. And again, and yeah, and again, you don't really see the people's faces that well, sort of like you're behind them as they're, I think they're drinking wine or they're just hanging out of their, like, what was know, that? Oh my God. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Here you, that used to happen a lot in this neighborhood, you know, oh, it's just everything that comes yeah. out of their mouth and, is so well-intentioned and wrong. It's yeah, so... it's uh, it's very, very powerful, and like there's just like this movie's just full of that. Like that is definitely, I think the crescendo, but like just this is a very good filmmaker at work here. This is a very smart filmmaker and somebody who I am excited to see more from. And this does not seem like the type of person that's going to go make a Disney movie. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, or like someone who needs a, like who needs. Ten million dollars to make a movie, although we, I'm sure he'd love it. But this looks like a, this can have been a very expensive movie, and it but it looks, looks great as good. I don't, yeah, like, I don't need a movie to look or feel any better than this movie looks and feels. Yeah, uh, uh, yeah. I love the driving shots. It was very Brown Bunny. I knew you'd think of that. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm a sucker for movies where you're just looking out the windshield of a car for like a minute, and I always get really mad. When the movie's cut away too quickly, and this movie does not. This movie holds it. <laughs> and I'm like, yes. All right. And that was at the very beginning. So already yeah. I was like, this is, I'm into this movie. I'm, you got me. I'm here. I'm riding in the car with the main character. And then, uh, well, my favorite part of the whole movie, and it was, I've never seen this done in a movie before. I know where is when he when he goes to visit his friend in jail. God damn, that's the most... I, it's such a powerful scene. Describe it. And yeah. so he goes to visit his friend in jail, and when you see the part in jail, it's like I mean, it's like the type of scene where you usually... Like the, you see in a movie where someone's talking to someone or the other in a glass, you know, who's in prison. But it's done in a much more confined-looking, grittier-looking... Like, usually those rooms in movies look kind of clean. Like, that's almost like the lobby of the jail, and you're able to kind of be on the other side, and it's in the other guys, and it's all white... And there's a lot of people there lined up. But this one, it just feels like he's in the jail cell almost. Like, it feels really cramped. And it's shot really tightly. But the conversation, you see, isn't there. You see, show them in the woods that they hung out in when they were younger. Oh, 
God, it's and, heartbreaking. And, and it cuts back and forth, and you'll hear like the sound of the guard being like, you have five more minutes or whatever. <clears throat> but you hear it while they're in the woods walking. There's something just so beautiful about that. And it's just sort of like, it's just, it's, in a, it's a very powerful scene. And I've never seen a movie do that before. Have you? No, no. Where like they're having the conversation in their, that's like where they want to be in their mind or the, in the memory. Again, it's that like the past and the present together and sort of like this, this world of memory and what it used to be like or what it could be. And it's very dream, very dreamlike, but without feeling like, uh, you know, it's not like a nightmare or it doesn't feel dreamlike in an arty David Lynchy way. It's just something just very organic and poetic. And just even when he sees his friend walk away and you hear the chains yep. on him while he's walking in the woods, but you don't see him. That's in, that again, great sound design, fucking incredible. Like that moment, that's, that's one of the strongest scenes in any movie from the last few years for sure. Yeah, um, and, it, and again, it has nobody's sets talking up about that it. ending. It sets up, <laughs> yeah, it, like by the time, so yeah. that by the time after that happens, and then he goes to the party, and they're just smoking weed, and he just came from this, like an like an elder who would have been there for him, we could have come back to, is erased from that neighborhood for doing the same thing that these people are doing, and. So the film is doing what film does so well is it sets up a situation where because we have a context that the people who are in the scene do not have. They can't like the guy who's handing Jay that joint can't know how what an insult, not even an insult. Yeah. Why it's why that is poking at a wound that is a an open wound and a guy the guy wouldn't do they certainly not intending to uh, stick that in a wound, but it does. And that that sets off Jay towards this, again, this brutal, unprovoked attack on a guy who's just walking down the street being white. Uh, but we, because of all the context it gives us, it's not unprovoked. It's provoked by white supremacy. It's provoked by a system that made all of this inevitable. And we haven't really talked about it, but when Jay first comes home, the first sign of this that he gets is this pink notice that's on his mom and dad's house. And they're like, yeah, the realtors come by every like three times a week or something like that. Like they're just being harassed by realtors who are trying to buy their house and that this so this this process of gentrification, colonization, whatever you're going to call it, is ever present, and you can feel it throughout the movie. Like there's always jackhammers, there's always construction, there's always things being torn down or put up, and it leads yeah. to this innocent moment of someone trying to create connection. Here, have a joint, brother, and that is all that's needed to reveal the wound that all of this is created. It's just, as Skinner said on last week's episode, I've probably never seen this because I haven't seen a lot of black cinema because a lot of black cinema has been uh, made less than avail less available than white cinema, obviously. Uh, but I... I do think there's some, that this is a special film and it's making a really important and special point in a way that, God damn, I wish more people would see it. So I could have, I think there, I think there's just so many conversations in here. Yeah. Yeah. And that scene, you're yeah. right. It was, it's yeah. devastating and beautiful and, and it's, it's, it is, it does, sort of I don't know what the what the right word it it brings together everything that has been happening throughout this film it's it's the end of the de detective story he's the only person from that time that he can find and oh man who is that actor because he was really special uh I'm just going to say it. I'm going to cut this in later. The name of that actor is 
and he's great. <laughs> um, yeah. And did you notice uh, Marawi Garima's mom, Shirkiana Aina, plays the mother of his friend Mike? There's a great scene where uh, Jay is go- goes out for a drive with his father, and his father's talking to his friend Mike, who just got out of prison. He's trying to be a good elder and be like, hey, just stay out of prison. I'm here for you. And his mom comes and is like, oh, they're hugging. And he's like talking about how they want to, how they're going to keep him out of prison. Uh, that is That role is played by Marawi Garima's mother, the director's mother. And then she also has a, cool. you know, a much more harrowing scene when, uh, again, spoiler alerts, but when Mike is killed later in the film. Um, and we don't exactly know how, but uh, probably through just, again, these cycles that make uh, these devastating endings unavoidable. Did you also see Marawi Garima shows up in the film just briefly in sort of a, in one of the dream sequences? Yeah, 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 yeah. And I only knew that, Tim, because we, uh, when we were talking about it with the Oscars a year ago, like we, like we hooked to his Instagram or something, so I knew what he looked like. So that was, yeah, it was fun to see him pop up for a moment there. Yeah, it's usually, I, I'm thinking, <laughs> this might be end up being a little bit of a short episode, I don't want to give the film short shrift, but one of the things is like usually when we're talking about films, they have a lot of movie stars in them. And then we're like, <laughs> we can go down all these rabbit holes of like, oh, well, did you see their other film? Blah, 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 blah. But this is really all like I, I've never seen any of these other actors. I guess probably Shurikiana Aina as, uh, you know, as part of that L.A. rebellion is the is probably the biggest star in the film. And she's the director's mom, so... And everybody in this movie is great, and it all feels really natural. And whether they're non-actors or whether these are just sort of, like, first-time actors or just actors you've never seen before and they've been in things. But, like, when you go on the IMDb page, like, nobody has a picture next to their name except yeah. for Go-Go Bouncy, <laughs> who plays the drum teacher. That's the only human being with a picture. Or, no, party host. Christopher Winter as party host. He has a picture. Nobody else has a picture. So in my mind, these are a lot of people that uh, maybe actually live here or that he, the director actually knew from his life. Um, and But they all, like, there's nobody who stands out as like, oh, this person can't hold their own against the other people, you know? Like, they're all really good. And like I think that's, again, a sign of a really great filmmaker because like, you'll be able to get performances out of people who don't have the same training as, you know, Hollywood movies you know, the kind of acting where people have studied it for years and years. Like this feels very much like a lived in movie. Like these are like, I totally believe all the people in this movie as being the people in this movie, even if they're pretending. Yeah. Well, if you're, uh, if you are one of our listeners who is in the industry, I just did a little research here. Obina Nwachukwu, who is the star of this film. And this is a star making performance in, uh, if anyone sees it, it should be. Uh, he is still, He's. this is the only film he's been in, uh, the, a full-length film. He's been in two shorts. And looking at his IMDb Pro, he, he's not with an agent. Uh, someone <laughs> should, this. I, I, I'm amazed. I am amazed that this, I mean, unless, maybe, but who knows? Maybe it's like uh, Skinner was saying. Like some people also make choices like yourself, uh, I guess to my, myself to some degree, make choices that m- mean that they are not as employable by Hollywood and they're going to have to do it under other in other ways. But I'll be, I won't be surprised. I will be mortified if <laughs> in four years <laughs> we look at this and he's like some other director doesn't realize the power of this actor and utilize it and put him in other films because yeah. it's just, yeah, it is. It Skinner was right. It is one of definitely one of the great performances of last year. Um, great. Well, well, that's residue. And, and like you said, this is on Netflix, so it is literally in everyone's home right now. <laughs> so there's no reason why after this 
You don't go watch it. Or before this, actually, I hope. Hopefully so before this. So really... <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but, or or you, if you did watch it and you listen to this, you can always recommend it to someone. And unlike some of the other movies we covered that are harder to find, you can literally say, you can text a friend and say, hey, there's this great movie I saw. It's on Netflix. Yeah. Like it's a click. It's a, literally a click away. Yeah. On your remote control. So. Seek it out. Make it popular. <laughs> Radio 8 Ball. Andras here. When I'm not co-hosting the World is Wrong podcast, I'm hosting and producing the Radio 8 Ball podcast, where we answer questions by picking songs at random, like picking musical tarot cards. We've hosted musical divinations for people like John C. Riley, Patricia Arquette, Tig Notaro, and Fred Armisen, and hosted over 200 songwriters providing the randomly chosen answers from Inara George and Dan Byrne to Mose Allison and Alan Toussaint. That's Radio 8 Ball, all one word. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts and download our app from the iTunes App Store. Hey babies, it is me, the self-appointed commissioner of comedy, James Matter. I just want to tell you that every week I'll be wherever you listen to podcasts with my show, The Commissioner of Comedy. I've been doing this, babies, for almost 20 years years grinding up and down and i'm here to convey it to you about the do's and don'ts of the comedy scene the proper etiquette the unwritten rules if you will whether you're just a fan or you're a young buck starting out a grizzled old vet or just someone who wants to peek behind the curtain and see how the sausage gets made tune into the podcast the commissioner of comedy this is what it's about it's only on paper house network and it's for you babies it's for you Dear listener, if you are just discovering our podcast, you can find all of our episodes on our website at theworldiswrongpodcast.com. You can also write to us at contact at theworldiswrongpodcast.com or follow us on Instagram at theworldiswrongpodcast. And now, back to the show. Eight notes, scale an octave. Master the scale... And you master the score. It's been a month in which cinema has has, has lost some giants. And uh, I was thinking about Peter Bogdanovich. Sorry, Peter Bogdanovich. Uh, <laughs> because he, uh, he recently died. And I was thinking about how Stephen Peros told me that he sent our podcast to Peter Bogdanovich. Huh. Uh, I, not, he didn't say if he listened to it or if he said anything good about it, but he just said that he forwards all the stuff about Cats Meow to Peter. Mm-hmm. And I, it was making me feel kind of nice that we had an opportunity to celebrate him, that he had the opportunity to hear if he had so chosen. And we wouldn't have had that opportunity without your insisting on doing cat's meow as a way <laughs> to make a shot at mank. And so whether it's your pettiness or your purity, I appreciate it. And I hope, I hope Peter Bogdanovich got a chance to hear it, but, uh, or at least be happy that anyone out there was really happy about the movie he made a while ago that didn't get a lot of fanfare. Yeah. Even just knowing that a podcast is about it. I don't know. Yeah. And, uh, do you have any thoughts on Peter Bogdanovich? Uh what's been nice about like what's always kind of the the bittersweet thing of when a filmmaker passes away is it forces people or makes people feel compelled to go back and watch some other stuff that they like because they, maybe people are going about their lives not thinking about the films of Peter Bogdanovich and then he dies and you're like oh shit oh yeah I like Piper Moon what else and so I've had a few friends Piper Moon did you say Piper Moon <laughs> Paper Moon <laughs> uh, and so I've had a few friends uh, watch Saint Jack recently and that's my favorite movie of his and they loved it and they, this is a movie that I think a lot of people either didn't hear about or just forgot about and that that's great when like people can kind of take the time to dig back and find, you know, find something by these people. 
Yeah. I used You've to, seen that movie, right? Yeah. St. Jack? Oh, so good. Yeah. And I used to see Peter Bogdanovich at a diner I used to go to in North Hollywood. And he'd be sitting at the counter eating, you know, diner food with his ascot. <laughs> and I really wish I had gone up and introduced myself now. He seems like the type of guy that would have just loved to talk to people about... If you just went up to him and said, hey, man, you knew Orson Welles, didn't you? He'd be like, well, and then you're stuck with him for three hours having breakfast. It just seems like, like I've known a few people that uh, actually met him and talked to him. Like I have a few friends that took a class that he taught, it, uh, a few classes that he taught. And it just seems like such a, yeah, you know, just like a wild ride. <laughs> you know, like, and he was a guest here once at the Alamo. And there's a lot of fun stories about kind of what that was like. So he just definitely was a character who lived, lived the, the film life. Um, and yeah, but I'm, yeah, I'm mostly glad that people are watching. Like, they all laughed and St. Jack and Nickelodeon and the stuff that pe- like people aren't like, necessarily are familiar with or have been familiar with. I have a feeling he wouldn't have wanted me to. He, he, di- he didn't look like he wanted to have his breakfast interrupted. <laughs> you think that but i don't know there's some people that like have that kind of ego where they're glad to talk to people about it. yeah i wish you i never, I you wish never I, know i wish i i wish i'd said something Just, yeah uh and he directed a film starring another giant of the the cinema we, we record these things uh you know weeks before these things come out so i know this is old news but uh, but we also lost Sidney Poitier, who starred in To Sir With Love 2, which yeah. Peter Bogdanovich directed as a TV movie in 1996. Uh, can we refer to that movie now as a cursed movie? I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> Two people from it died. No. <laughs> so same with Casablanca. I know, a cursed movie, <laughs> Casablanca. Everybody's dead. It's a cursed movie. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and you know, it's given me an opportunity to also, I've been, again, the, the one of the ways to that we, we mourn the loss of film greats is to go back and look at films that they were in. Uh, did you find yourself drawn back to any, uh, any Poitier films? You know what's good? Um, I gotta look up the name of it. Hold on, let's pretend that I knew the answer to this question. Um, because this is where I this is where I went with him. Uh, give me a second. I want to get this right. <clears throat> yeah, there's a movie that I saw <laughs> called Shoot to Kill. Do you remember Shoot to Kill? Oh, the Tom Berenger film. Yeah, where it's Sidney Poitier basically like hunting, like they're they're hunting like a murderer in the woods, played by I think it's Clancy Brown, and it's just sort of like a weird sort of action survival movie. Kind of reminded me of The Edge a little bit too, where it's just like Tom Berenger and Sidney Poitier in the woods, and Tom Berenger is sort of like the expert on the woods, and Sidney Poitier is the guy from the city, <laughs> and <laughs> it's good. It's funny. It's weird. Uh, it's a great movie. Like, and it's not. It's definitely not like one of his prestige movies, but I think it's one that maybe people don't think about. That I think it's worth. It's worth checking out because he's funny in it. He's great. I mean, he's always great. And it's just like it's just one of those strange little eight, late eighties, you know, movies that I think the world for, forgot about. Yeah, I. Uh, well, first I went back to one of the obvious ones, but in the heat of the night, I, I, I hadn't seen it in a while. And it's a film that I used to be weirdly hostile to when I used to care about the Oscars. Cause in 67, it beat out Bonnie and Clyde and the graduate and maybe, and maybe cool hand Luke. Like it was just sort of like all these films that at the time I was more into, but now I see, that the Academy was right. Although they awarded, um, God, what's his name? The name who plays the, the sheriff, Rod Steiger. He, they rewarded Rod Steiger with the Academy award and didn't even nominate Sidney Poitier. And he's definitely the more iconic, <laughs> although whatever. Yeah. Uh, 
So watching that was great. But the one that was a discovery for me, there's a film called Pressure Point. Hmm. I don't know it's that one. from 1962. And it's a Stanley Kramer film. And I, I'd love to actually do an episode about Stanley Kramer because I think he's a really, really interesting director. Flawed, but very, but, uh, but very ambitious in a sort of political film sense. And this is Sidney Poitier, Bobby Darin, and Peter Falk. Oh, wow. And it is awesome. And What year was this? 62. Okay. And Poitier plays a psychologist, a psychiatrist maybe, in a, in, a, in a prison, who we meet him when Peter Falk storms into his office, and he's, he's an older doctor. And the, Poitier is playing an older doctor, and Peter Falk storms into his office, and he's quitting uh, working on this, with this client that he's given him, uh, a, a patient, a prisoner, a prisoner, I guess a patient, who is a black guy who hates Peter Falk so much and he's just like can't I you you need to give him a black psychologist it shouldn't be me I can't be the guy and he's doing it very super Peter Falky which is awesome and then Sidney Poitier tells the story about when he was the psychiatrist to Bobby Darren playing a white supremacist post war in like in the four, in the late 40s early 50s and Poitier being the first black doctor there and having and just it really deals with have it's that what uh, Poitier had to deal with of being the first or the only the sort of the Jackie Robinson factor and how you're having to you're you're an authority to some degree, but you're also on a different team than it really takes on white supremacy in a way in a very uh not as in, as deeply maybe uh, certainly as uh, the film we just covered residue but it really does feel like it's not like it, it's in the same realm of trying to take this stuff on and there's a, a just for the, the for the fun of it at the end there's a scene where Peter Falk is about to walk out the door and he turned and he's smoking a cigarette and he turns around to deliver a last line like, uh, one more thing. <laughs> and <laughs> it's so, I mean, and then he go and Columbo. <laughs> it's like this proto Columbo moment. That's great. <laughs> that then, and this is the thing about Stanley Kramer. It's like, it's so good. And then it ends on a joke about blackface. Whoa. <laughs> and you're like, Oh man, you just, Oh, god damn you movie. Like god damn you 1962. Uh yeah. So uh but I I I definitely recommend it. Poitier is great. Bobby Darren is uh is I think a very underrated actor. He's a he plays a really he's almost like Eric Von, like the real version of Eric Von Zipper in this film. Like there's this scene, you know, Eric Von Zipper from the Beach Blanket Bingo movies. I don't know, but you know, you know the guy. You we, you know the 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 biker, the head of the biker gang in the Beach Blanket Bingo movies. Oh, uh, Timothy Carey. No, character? not the Timothy Carey. The, the stop the music! Stop the music! Yeah, uh, that's enough for the first time. It's funny when I dance with boys, I usually stumble, but with you, it's different. Yeah, well, I'm different. I'd worry about that, boss. Eric von Zeppa never worries. Pete, I was perfect. Yes, you were wonderful. Thanks to Eric Von Zipper. And now I'm going to let you ride with me partner in the sickle crisscross country race. You're a little late. She rides with Ricky. She don't ride with nobody but me. <laughs> the hat. Get the hat. Uh, I'm I, don't know, I haven't seen I this movie like... since I was a child. Anyway, so, uh, <laughs> but like, sort of like that and like Wild One, Marlon Brando. And there's a scene where they, or he and his gang take over this restaurant bar and they're like they're sort of there's they take the proprietors hostage and the whole gang just paints uh tic-tac-toe everywhere including on the man and the woman and just leaves the place <laughs> all tic-tac-toed which i thought was just a a great cinematic uh, moment. <laughs> uh, um, sorry, the, the the endless debate of what is and what isn't cinematic need not rage here. And 
Yeah, and I and I know we've just talked. We we we've I've just gone on and on about this, but I also wanted to tell my story about meeting Sidney Poitier. Oh, that's right. You yes, tell tell the story. So it's very short. I don't have nearly as much to say about it as I have to say about Pressure Point. I auditioned for Ghost Dad, <laughs> and I walked into the reading, and Sidney Poitier was there. And did I you was, know he was going to be there? No. <laughs> and I was so blown away to be in his presence that I just sort of fell all over myself telling him how honored I was to meet him. And, of course, you, I didn't get the job. Uh, so I don't – like, it's weird, one of those weird Hollywood regrets. Like, I don't regret treating that moment with the – in, with the gravity that it deserved, but I also, but I do regret that I'm that uncool that I feel like I need to tell <laughs> people things when I should have just kept it to myself and done my job and acted. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but I'm no Sidney Poitier, so I'm sure he didn't do that when he walked into offices. Uh, so that's my. Uh, and you said you've watched Ghost Dad. I haven't watched Ghost Dad. Oh, I've I've seen, seen Ghost Dad a lot. <laughs> there was a time where that was the movie that I watched was Ghost Dad. <laughs> well, maybe we should do an episode about it. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, people are you know don't feel too happy about Bill Cosby, <laughs> you know, in this but world. But it's a City Poitier uh, film. It's a, but we can look at it as a City Poitier film instead. Uh, no, there's definitely there's something special about Ghost Dad. I've always thought so. And uh, for people who aren't aware, Sidney Poitier is was also a director. Directed films like Uptown Saturday Night and the the its two sequels. Directed Stir Crazy. Uh, what else? Uh, fast forward, which the we've... flash dance fame, uh, yeah, <laughs> rip off. I've seen it. That's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> it exists. <laughs> he did hanky panky, the Gene Wilder Gilda Radner movie. I think I've seen that. It's you know, I, I, this is one of the odd. Uh, so you'd think that the partnership that would come out of Stir Crazy would be Poitier and Pryor, but no, no. it's Poitier and Gene Wilder. Wilder. <laughs> I know. It's awesome. It's, yeah. <laughs> I, you know what? I have a feeling, like at that time when Richard Pryor is doing a lot of cocaine and burning himself up, I think Poitier made the right right choice. To Gene work. Wilder is safer. Uh, Gene Wilder is probably an easier moment, guy. 80, Although. Early I 80s. Yeah, I, I can I, yeah, I, Anyway, I, I, I would love to uh, I would love to I would love to have gotten a chance to work with with uh, on the set with uh, Sidney Poitier and to see how he directs, because some of his films, those the, the Uptown Saturday Night films, I think, are they're just some of my favorite comedies in general. They're they're so good, so well cast, so funny. Yeah. And uh, the chemistry between him and Cosby is fantastic. And again, I know blah, blah, blah. I don't want to say I don't want to say blah blah blah. Refer back to our episode about the wrongness. There's a lot more to a film than any one participant, certainly than any one actor, and uh, that those films are full of great actors, and they're a great job of directing from Sidney Poitier. And we'll probably give them brief in memoriams when we get to the Oscars. But I felt like both yeah. those artists deserved a little bit of love. Yeah, and uh, so Brian, why don't you tell us what we're going to be talking about next week? On the oh World my goodness, we are uh, our second TV series. We did the Ben Stiller show was the first one we covered back in December, but we're doing Cosmic Slop, an early '90s HBO Twilight Zone type uh, show from the creators of House Party and Boomerang, uh, hosted by George Clinton. Uh, it's uh, never really been released on DVD or anything. Nobody talks about it. When you see lists of shows of HBO that are great, it never makes the top 100 even. <laughs> and I disagree. <laughs> so I think we're going to let people know about this, get them, get them hip to Cosmic Slop, and then maybe we can demand that a box set or something comes out. Or HBO brings it back and just has it where you can watch it. Uh, yeah, I'm excited. So I, I don't know where. I guess you could find them on YouTube. They're, they're, that's the the closest way to watch it if you want to watch it before the show is go to YouTube, type in Cosmic Slop. There'll be some episodes on there, not all well, of them. It, it, and it'll be a little bit confusing because it'll get a lot of uh, 
Parliament the, Funkadelic song, yeah. and the song. So yeah. you need to look for yeah. the the T- show TV, and yeah. the episode. The first episode is called Space Traders. So you might want to start. Yep. You might want to include that in your search. Traders, yeah. like Trader Joe's. Um, not like Benedict Arnold traders. <laughs> Although space traders could be a good, that could be a good thing as well. A good film, yeah. not a good thing. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Betrayal's never good in any, in any yeah, situation. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so yeah, so have, so get ready for that. I, I had not heard of it before. Brian turned me on to it. I am better for it. You will be too. And I can't wait for that conversation. But I will until next week. (laughs) Between now and then, if you want to get in touch with us to share your impressions of what we have said here about this or anything else, you can reach us at contact at the world is wrong podcast dot com. You can find all of our episodes, a page for each of these episodes at www dot the world is wrong podcast dot com. I really do encourage you to check it out. I put a lot of work into that and try to make good resources, put good resources and pictures and things in there. It's a lot of fun. I have a blast, and I hope you will as well. And if you do, uh, post about it and connect and, <laughs> and tag us and, you know, do whatever. Link to us at the World is Wrong podcast on Instagram and at World is Wrong pod on Twitter. And um, unless you have any last words for the audience, Brian? No, I'm happy. Then uh, I don't know how you could be happy after th- this this film residue, but... You know, no, you, of course, happy because we saw greatness. And anytime there's a great film, it, uh, it just makes That's the world a, a better thing. place. Yeah. 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 So everyone, just remember, wherever you are, whenever you are, however you are, the world is wrong. And it's probably wrong about you. Back to camp? Yeah, about a week. Hey man, did I ever say goodbye when I left? I mean, when we was leaving, we was moving. I mean, I don't know. I remember when y'all left though. What you remember? I remember we all rode our bike to y'all new house. For real? Yeah, nigga, you don't remember that? Not really. Who was with us? Me, you, Demetrius, CC, Jacob. It was all of us. Man, that's wild. You got a good ass memory, man. Yeah, I remember because I couldn't believe how big your house was. That house was big as shit. That's wild, man. Crazy, remember that? Yeah, man, everybody remember that. Y'all house the cornerstone, son. Miss Vani, Mr. Reggie, everybody felt that. Anyway, what's up with the film? Uh, it's coming together. You know, I got some good stuff to write. I'm gonna write it when I get back to LA. Yeah, I seen you saying going to house to house getting information. Yeah. You know, I've been thing about doing something like writing a movie or a book or something. Oh, for real? It's an idea. Yeah. Hey, what's it about? It ain't not too much, man. Come on, man. You ain't gonna tell me. Come on. All right. It's about this boy living in a war zone. He had this brother. He was real tight. The boy ended up leaving, going doing his own thing. But a brother had to stay home in the war zone, take care of the family, put food on the table, make sure everybody's straight. The brother that's gone don't know what's going on. He's living it up. Our brother got to take care of them responsibilities. The brother that's gone, he come back home. Still a war zone, but now it's a jungle. He think of everything sweet in this jungle. His own family don't give a shit about him. And they know that he don't give a shit about that. Because he left. No matter what he say. No matter what he do. 
They see right through his transparent eyes. Hi, I'm Brian. And I'm AJ. And we have a podcast called The Director's Wall. Examining a filmmaker's career, film by film. First up was M. Night Shyamalan, then Francis Ford Coppola. Who's next? Is there anything to this whole auteur theory? Find out on The Director's Wall. Subscribe via Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or...